Beautiful storm of Bethlehem, shine. 
That's enough. He's God. Can we give him a hand clap of praise in this house? Hallelujah. Amen. Can you remain standing? We need to go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Brent Holland, our friend, our, our brother in Christ is not doing well. He's in his last stages of cancer. And I know that God's able. I believe that he can just speak the word right now. Brother Brant can be healed. But it's in God's hands. We're going to pray again for Brother Brant. Also, Brother Lamar Chapman's wife, Tanya. Brother Lamar's in Alabama. One of our friends in the ministry. She's having her third heart cath since October. Tomorrow, he, he sent a text out to several asking ministers to pray. We have several families gone this morning traveling out of town to see the family. Let's pray for traveling mercies. 
Can we just bind together? Unspoken request with an uplifted hand. Can you just reach up in faith and touch the master this morning? Father, I cry out to you because you're God and there is no other. Lord, we bring our petitions to the very throne of grace. Lord, you're a merciful God. I cry out to you, Lord, for healing to come down to Brother Brent Hall and this precious man of God, our brother in Christ. Lord, he's a dad. He's a, he's a friend. There's so many things he is to so many people. Lord, I'm asking you to reach down and touch this man with a mighty touch of heaven. Touch the family today, Lord. I pray that you would give us faith to believe we're speaking life and healing to his body. There's nothing that's too hard for our God. In the name of Jesus Christ, bring healing to Brother Brant. For Tanya Chapman, we ask you, Lord, that you would reach down and touch her wherever she is. Let the virtue and healing of the Lord Jesus Christ flow through this body. Right now, we discern the very stripes that Jesus took on his back at Calvary. We believe that you're able. We speak life and healing to Tanya's body in Jesus' name. Lord, for everyone that's sick in this place, those that are sick at home, that are struggling, we speak life and healing in Jesus' name. We know and I, we believe that you're able right here, right now, to work the miracle. Lord, for needs, whatever the need is in this place, those watching by Facebook, you care. Lord, I'm asking you to meet every heart's cry today, touch every life in the name of Jesus. For those traveling, give them traveling mercies. And Lord, we're going to thank you for what you're going to do in this service this morning in advance. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated in his wonderful presence. If our ushers could come to receive the morning tithe and offering. Youth fundraiser, parents night out. It's going to be, this can be whatever you want it to be, a shopping night or a date night for you and your spouse. Thursday, December the 22nd. There's a catch. Thursday, December 22nd from 6 to 9 p.m., 0 to 11 years of age. They're going to have games, snacks, crafts provided for the child, but it's $20 per child or $30 for your whole family if you have children in that age bracket. And this is for a youth fundraiser. So our youth are going to be doing this for a youth fundraiser. So again, that's Thursday, December the 22nd from 6 to 9 p.m., 0 to 11 years of age, $20 per child. Or if you have four or five kids, it's $30. That, you can't beat that deal. Special Christmas service next Sunday morning. Now, we haven't had Christmas fall on Sunday in many years, but what we're going to do, the service starts at 1030. We're going to have a special time of we're going to sing worship songs. We're going to spend time just worshiping the Lord, and then we're going to have communion after to adjourn this service. It's going to be a very special time. And then, of course, Sunday night service. There will be no evening service. That's very rare. I believe there's only two services a year that we don't have an evening service. But we will be meeting Sunday morning at 1030 for, for worship and communion. Very, very intimate time. And then Wednesday night meals will be paused during the Christmas holidays. Our last meal will be this coming Wednesday, December 21st, and resume on January the 11th, 2022. Amen. Brother Jose, can you bless the offer? Amen. We're going to be designating the first week of every month Missions Sunday. So I want you to pray and ask the Lord what you would, what you could give, a recurring gift to the mission field. We support missionaries along with, along with all the things that we're doing in Central America in three different locations. I want you to pray about it. I, I just believe that if we can give, we can we can expedite what. We need to do in these last days and reach the loss for Christ.
Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, choir musicians. At this time, we're going to dismiss all of our children from age 5 to 12 to Children's Church. It's my honor to tell you, precious man and woman of God, Brother and Sister Downs are with us this morning. Come ahead, Brother Darren. I love this man and his wife. Come ahead, brother. He's going to minister to us today. We've become very good friends throughout the years. Brother Duke, I consider Brother Duke his father. He pastors in Chino, California. I, just, I call him my pastor. Uh, he's just, he's kind of like a father figure to me. So Brother Darren shares his dad with me a little bit. Hey man, I love you, brother. Preach to us. Truly an honor to be here at Harvest Time Church with all of you. You know, I appreciate the Spirit of God in this place. I, uh, you know, a lot of people are leaving California, and that's okay. There's a lot of times I want to leave it. Uh, but I, I always tell them, you need to go to Tyler if you're going to leave because there's a church there. You know, it, it doesn't matter where you live. You just need to be, the house, be in the house of God. You need to live in some of the worst areas of this world. But if you can find the fellowship of believers, you can make it. But you can't make it, no matter if you live in the best place, if you don't have the household of faith. You know, you, you know we, we can't just make it on our own. We weren't designed that way. We were designed to be a part of the family of God. And I do appreciate that much. I appreciate this church. I appreciate all of you. I'm thankful for the missions of this church. You know, the most important mission you have or the most important mission in the world is the one that God gave you. You know, the one that God sets before a church is the most important. It doesn't matter where it's at. Doesn't matter if it's down the street, across seas, or the country next door. That is the most vital and important mission, and we have to treat it as such. And I'm so thankful for what God is doing through this church in Central America, uh, where you all just have been over this last week. Uh, but I want you to know, too, you also help us and, and give support to us at Living Waters, and we're sending that around the world. And just one, I'll give you one little short report. Uh, before I get into the message today, but you know, in Bangladesh, we had uh, the brother that we're supporting there visit us on Father's Day this year and brought a personal report, but he has sent another one since then. And you know, uh, we were so impressed when he came and shared with us. He's a man of God, he's Pentecostal, uh, he's from the Presbyterian Church, but in that country, they are Pentecostal. I, I asked him one day about it. Uh, we saw the Spirit of God move and I noticed he knew exactly what was going on. He was very comfortable in it. And I asked him, he said, man, we're Presbycostals, brother. That's, that's just what we are. And he said that, you know, we have the name Presbyterian. He said, but, you know, we've had a visitation from God. I looked in the history of that. I believe it came out of the Welsh revival. A, a man went there from Wales. And, uh, of course, they ended up seeing the power of God move there. But, you know, we've been supporting him a long time. And over the years, he has seen over 10,000 souls come to Christ in that dark place of Bangladesh. But just in this recent year, uh, some of the new things we have heard, his workers working out in different places, one of the areas where they went and planted a church, they baptized 48 people in that one little village there. And so we thank God for that. But also, too, the Rohingya refugees, you know, uh, you don't hear a lot about them on the news. They're not a forefront. Uh, in the media, but they are a tribe of people, most of them Muslims, almost all of them, and they were driven out of Burma, Myanmar we know it as today, uh, being persecuted by the Burmese army and by the Burmese government. Well, they were driven into Bangladesh, and if you're a refugee and you're trying to find refuge in Bangladesh, I can tell you you're a desperate person. Uh, you know, the pictures that I've seen over the years of them coming across the muddy fields and through rivers, all the things they had to do to get into Bangladesh just to have refuge there. Well, uh, this brother that we work with, I'm leaving him nameless for the safety of it being on the Internet and that, but if you need more detail, I'll be happy to tell you personally, no problem at all. But, you know, he, he was telling me about it, and in the beginning we assumed they were 100% Muslim. We had no idea of any Christians among them, but as we began to send workers out amongst them that go into the refugee camps in time, we have discovered 600 Christian families. Now, you multiply that, that, that goes probably about 2,000 people. If you, you know, you begin to add it up, they have a lot of kids. 
But since then, the work has gone from just going in trying to reach them, but now we have established church services amongst them. We now have discipleship going on amongst them, teaching them the school of Christ. Uh, it's one of the things we're using the Burmese language to do it. They know it. Uh, not an easy thing to do to use the, the language of your persecutor to teach you, but they're letting us do it, and so we thank God for that. I taught that school in the Burmese language almost 20 years ago and uh, in a basement in Burma. I had no idea that we would ever see uh, see it be used in, in a way like this. Uh, one of the weirdest places I had been, uh, but we would travel back and forth to a hotel, and we taught that school underneath a house there and had about 20 students in the room uh, putting it into the Burmese language, and what a blessing that was. But uh, just recently, they baptized over 40 people in one of the houses of the Rohingya. And so we thank God for that. There's multiple refugee camps. They're not all in one camp. And so we've got workers <clears throat> that are going out amongst them and working in the various camps. And so you're a part of that frontline work there. And we so greatly appreciate it. On top of all the other things that God has given you and, and that you're doing so well, you're helping us there. And I, for one, greatly appreciate that. But I can tell you, I always appreciate it when I see a church go after the missions that God gave them. You know, I, I'm not a competitive person when it comes to missions. I, to me, if you're doing missions, you're helping me, whether we're working in the same field or not. You know, we're in the same kingdom together, and I strive to, to see that vision placed in churches everywhere in this world because we all, if we all take part in that mission field, the devil doesn't have a chance. Amen. And so I thank God for all that he's doing through this church. It's important, it's vital, and I thank God for the sacrifices you're making to see that through. And thank you so much for helping us. Amen? Praise God. Well, this morning I want to share with you from, I'll begin in 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm going to begin at the first verse. Amen. Just share with you this thought, where fell it? Be talking about that axe head that fell into the water. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. Father, we come to you in this house this morning. God, we ask that you'd talk to our hearts today. We're not here, Lord, to be entertained. We're here, Lord, to hear from you. We're here, Lord, to worship you, and we've done it. And we're going to continue doing it. We worshiped you in song. We worshiped you in our giving as we shared our life in our givings in that offering plate. Lord God, we want to hear from you today. And I pray could talk to every heart in this house, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask it. We give you the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master. For it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And they cut down a stick and cast in, the, in thither. And the iron did swim. That is the cross, the resurrection life, making that axe head to swim. Now verse 7 says, Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand, and he took it. Now in Psalm chapter 37 Verse 23 and 24. Psalm 37, verse 23, beginning there. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he, fail, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. He will not stay down. It's not the end of his story. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Literally, upholding him is upholding him with his hand. Then Matthew 14, beginning at verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, 
bid me come unto thee on the water. He said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus, while eleven others stood there back in that boat watching him as he was the only one to step out in the courage of faith. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to be like an axe head. He was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Our last verse is in Romans, 11, Romans 8, verse 11. Romans 8 and 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now we've read the axe head was made to float. We also read a good man, though he may go down, he will not remain down. Peter sinks, but he does not go under. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, if it dwells in us, will raise us. We're talking about something being raised today. We're talking about something being made to live. Something that seems to be lost, but yet is going to be restored. We begin by looking at these sons of the prophets. They were not merely just prophets and students of prophecy. We've had a lot of that in this day and age. We see people, they had... Uh, a movement years ago, school of the prophets, different things. This is something very different here. They're not just prophets and students of prophecy, but they're a group of men that are to carry the living message of faith and the reality of God to the next generation. More than anything, that's what prophetic ministry is. It is not standing before somebody, telling them that their stomach hurts or they have a bad knee or they got a headache. That, that's not what prophecy is all about. Nor is it just telling of future events. It is being able to make heaven live in this earth. That's what the difference truly is. Amen. That is something that every generation must have. Someone or someones must be able to perpetuate living truth. Living truth must be passed down to the succeeding generations or it will fail somewhere. And history of the church shows us of those times where it failed to be passed on. They must impress the reality of God, these prophets. They must impress the reality of God on the mind, the heart, and the faith of the generation in which they live. They must have an impact. Amen. God told the prophet Ezekiel that he was to reveal what he revealed to him, that he was, Ezekiel was, to show it to the house of Israel. He was to write it in their sight. He was to speak it unto them. He was to measure it, to show them what all of this was, all the forms of learning. In other words, Ezekiel, by the Spirit of God, was to make that message a living reality to the people of his day. Amen. He wasn't just to stand there and tell them about God. He was to show them that this God lives. So we have a group of men, a guild, so to speak, of young prophets, and their leader is Elisha. These men have a great responsibility upon them. Just as pastors, leaders of ministries, teachers, and even parents, we all have this responsibility upon us. I knew, even outside of being a preacher, that in my home, that my children needed to know the reality of this God. They needed to know that what was in that church, what they seen in the men of God that preached, must be real in their own heart and life. They too must also have that experience. Amen. What brought these men to this place here at the Jordan River? What was their purpose? Well, it's clearly stated it was enlargement. They wanted growth. The place where they were dwelling was too narrow, they said. They were restricted, confined, and they wanted to have more room. Now, I thank God that they were able to sense that. There's not too many people that can sense the constriction. And part of it is, if you're not filled with the Spirit, or you don't desire the moving of the Spirit, then you're going to feel comfortable right where you're at. But when you are filled with the Spirit of eternity, when you're filled with the God that lives outside of time, 
You're going to be constantly pushing out at the borders of that life, saying there's got to be more. There has to be more than what I see, than what I know. Amen. And they begin to sense that there is some kind of a limitation here. And thank God they not only could sense it, but there was a willingness in their heart to do something about it. I've traveled this world for over half of my life. And I've been told by countless people from countless backgrounds, from countless countries about what they thought the need of their nation was. They had a sense of enlargement. But I can tell you of the multitudes that told me that, a very small percentage ever stepped out to do anything about it. A very small percentage ever went down to the Jordan River with an axe. In the spiritual life, we're going nowhere if we don't hunger for enlargement, for advancement in this kingdom. Amen. You know, I, I wonder sometimes at churches that have no missions. You know, I think, how could you be satisfied with just four walls and a roof over you? You know, when, when this kingdom is advancing, I mean, we're the life we claim to have is advancing a moving life. Amen. It's a light that demands to confront darkness. Amen. And so it pushes constantly outside of the walls of the household of faith. Amen. That hunger for enlargement amongst the sons of the prophets was the root. And it led to the miraculous event that was to follow shortly. And if there's no hunger for enlargement in the things of God, then it's going to be pretty much likely that the miraculous is not going to be seen. Wherever you see hunger, wherever you see a desire for advancement, wherever you see a desire for spiritual growth in the individual, in the church as a whole, then you're going to begin to see God move by his almighty power. He comes to that hunger. Amen. He comes to it. And I, I've seen people sometimes a little bit mixed up, but there was hunger there. And if there's hunger there, you don't shut that down. You guide that hunger. Guide them in truth. Amen. By the power of the Holy Spirit. It should be appreciated that these young prophets were not willing to have spiritual enlargement without the previous generation being involved. You know, we've lived to see a day that people will yield to enlargement of the church. Glory to God. We live to see a day that people want nothing to do with that previous generation. And, and they don't want any part of it. They feel like that previous generation is the restriction. And what they want to do is run away from that. But these young prophets, they knew better. And they came to that man, Elisha, and they asked him, Will you go down with us to this place of the Jordan? Anything new that God does is built upon that old, upon the foundation of that old. Whether it was Christ when he was there, brought to the temple as a baby, and that man, Simeon, representing all of that Old Testament, took him in his hands and held him up. The Old Testament held up the Christ, held up the Savior of the world that we sung about this morning. Amen. And Jesus said, do not think that I have come to do away and with or undo the law or the prophets. I have come not to do away with or undo, but to complete and to fulfill them. He come to build upon that foundation. Amen. Hallelujah. Over and over, we find it stated that the scriptures might be fulfilled. That's just telling us we're building this new covenant, this new foundation, this new testament is built upon the scriptures of that Old Testament, the fulfillment of them, the advancement of them, the going on of them. When the children of Israel crossed the, into the land of promise, they left 12 stones there in that Jordan River. But amongst those that come across, there was Joshua and Caleb. These were the only two that knew Egypt and had made it all the way through the journey to enter into the land of promise. God made sure that there was somebody from that previous generation. Amen. I feel so fortunate in my life to have been connected to men of that previous generation. There's not very many of them left anymore. I serve under one of them as my pastor, that, that he's one of those that comes out of that old generation 
And we're not going to get into the fullness of what God desires without people like that. Amen? Without that connection with them. I'm always concerned when I hear people of the modern day begin to try to defame those that come from the past, those that stood and gave us the foundation that we have, that built the household of faith that we are entering into, that have given us such a foundation that we stand upon. Amen. The doctrines, I believe, of divine healing, of missions, all these great things of salvation, that Christ alone is the Redeemer, that all comes from those previous generations that experienced it and told me what it was. But church, the axe head had to swim in my own life. Amen. We cannot destroy the foundation of the old without destroying the very thing we're built upon. It will destroy our own lives as well. I think this is the reason that so much of the church today is devoid of miraculous power. We want nothing to do with the foundation that gave us the faith to be able to believe for that miraculous power. Amen. But not so with these young prophets. They said, we're taking the one from that previous generation. Amen. And I appreciate that they went to do something about the problem they were facing, and they took that one from the old generation with them. Without him, they're not going to know what to do. We're going to see that very clearly. Every Christian at some point has felt like these men, these young prophets did. They have felt like them as they went down there, and they begin to fell those trees, and that axe head falls off. You and I feel like there's so much in our life that, that, that we need more of, of God. You know, I've been walking with God for over half of my life. I was raised in church, but there was times that I was away from God. I didn't really serve Him. But I can tell you, I live knowing that there's more of God. There's more to possess. This isn't over with. Amen. Until my dying breath, I know that there's advancement with God. And every Christian has at some point in their life felt that. If they didn't act upon it, if they didn't move towards God, that hunger will begin to fade. And it'll come back and maybe visit again if God has mercy. But if we don't act upon it, we'll lose that appetite. We feel like sometimes there's so much more of God than what we already have. You know, like T. Austin Sparks said years ago, he said, I tell you in all faithfulness, you will feel to the very end until he raptures you that there is more to be accomplished in your life than has already been accomplished. There is a work that's going on. Amen. There's so much more of his presence to experience. There's so much more of a life of encountering this God. Amen. Yet how few in the church will take action to move upon that? How few will go down to Jordan's waters with an axe and begin to fell those trees and begin to try to build and to see that movement forward in life? You know, seeking the deeper things of God is what that means to go down there and to fell those trees, to begin to come to God in that place of prayer. And in all honesty, just to say to him, God, all that I've learned, all that's been passed down to me, God, I'm so grateful for it. But God, I want to know you in my own life. God, I want a personal encounter with you. God, I want this to be a reality in my life. That is failing those trees down there by the Jordan. Amen. Stepping out in faith like Peter did on the waters. That is failing those trees down there by that Jordan. Amen. Jesus said to those disciples, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. They had, they had need of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to enlarge that vessel. And that isn't just to make it bigger. Amen. It isn't just to make it bigger, but it's to supplant the carnal mind with the mind of the Spirit. It is to broaden the understanding to contain what is presently now beyond us. Amen. So much of what goes on in our life is not so much making us bigger, but it's the displacement of the things in our life that are in the way. Amen. Paul commanded the Corinthians, be ye also enlarged. Pastor Clendenin taught us in the school of Christ that lesson, our greatest need, and that lesson is spiritual enlargement. It is to grow, it is to move forward. And anybody that knew Pastor Clendenin knew until late into his 80s, he still was desiring more of this God. 
I remember one of the last trips I made with him. We went to Egypt. We're up there in that city, outside the city of Alexandria. And we're in that room. And they gave us a room to share, two beds in there. And just watching that old man of God and, and, and just listening to the hunger, I marveled at it. To see a man at that age, in those advanced years, and he preached to his dying day. Amen. These sons of the prophets, they went forth to do something about the present situation. They're cutting the trees. They're cutting those beams of wood. And God's true people are always a working people. Amen. You know, there, 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 there's this people sometimes that just, you know, well, all you have to do is have faith. Well, that faith isn't sitting at home and not being a part of the family of God. Amen. This gospel's not theories. It's a reality. And faith produces something. Hallelujah. But these young men, they're looking for growth and enlargement, and they're setting their efforts in an expectation to receive. They went down there because they're saying, we can build this. We know we can. We're, we can develop this. And, and part of that is where our undoing is. Because we think that we can just borrow the power from somebody else, borrow the message, borrow the words, borrow the school of Christ, and then go overseas and be able to do something with it. Church, I've had a many of axe head in my life fall off that handle. Amen. Many of axe head in my life fall off that handle. But I was going there to try to bring enlargement. Grace never comes to the lazy, the indolent. We're working, we're not working for our salvation. That's not possible. But we can't sit there and do nothing in our life either. The difference between working for the gift and acting in the obedience of faith is motive. It's motive. Works are motivated by law and self-proving. But the obedience of faith is not the works of the law. The obedience of faith is motivated by love and by devotion and by a heartfelt agreement with Christ. His will has become my will. Uh, you know, just lately I've, I've just been marveling at looking at the prayers of the apostle for the church of the apostle Paul. How many times did he pray they would know the will of God, that they would fulfill the will of God? It wasn't just all the little needs of the church, and there were many, but he knew that the most abundant need was knowing and acting upon the will of God. Because if you know that will, if you're moving in that will, every need of that church will be answered in the moving forward of that will of God. Amen. It is when we are at life's work that we begin to be confronted with things of this life. Amen. We begin to realize in reality what is really of us and what is really borrowed from somebody else. What is ours and what is somebody else's. You know, the old preacher Paris Reedhead, I, I learned a lot from him. But, you know, he, he passed away years ago. But he went through an experience in the mission field working. He worked in Sudan and one or two other countries. But he said, I, I, I was just an awful person, mean. He said, I, I was good at cutting people up with my tongue, and I destroyed everybody I worked with. He said, one day, the other missionaries come to me. They said, you know, we believe that you're a Christian, but sometimes we wonder. He said, so I went back home, went back to the United States, and he said, I thought my answer was the Bible school. So I went back to the Bible school and checked in, bought my books. And he said, I went into the room. I, I rented a dorm. I think it was for four months or six months, whatever he, he had at least. And he said, I opened those books. And he said, I knew everything in those books already. He said, so I closed that book and I went back down to the office and told him, he said, I made a mistake. And he said, they told him, they said, well, you've got a lease on that room. That can't be broken, but you can sell your books back, cancel your classes. So he stayed there, but he didn't do all the classes. He said, I already knew all that stuff. He said there was a, a local, it was an evangelist at a local church. He said, so I went there. I sat in the back. And he said, that rascal preached to only me. He says, if I was the only guy in the building, and he addressed me. And he said, I broke in that place, and I began to pray. He said, and God showed me a tree, and it had all these leaves on it. And God said, that tree is you, and not one leaf grew out of your own branches. You borrowed every one of them. You picked them up from some book you read. You got them from somebody else. And that's your problem. The life's never sprung forth in you. And that had to change. Peter was confronted there that day with a challenge. 
Step out of that boat. Well, we always major in him sinking. But there were 22 eyeballs in that boat that never stepped out. Amen. He was willing to step out on that water. You know, sometimes we wish, you know, we'd go back there and be one of them and crawl out there too. Go down or not, at least I made a attempt at it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everything was going good for these sons of the prophets. They're at work. They've got a good thing they're doing, trying to enlarge things. But that axe head fell off and was lost. And it came off while they were working. Came off while they were attempting to do good things. And I can tell you, every one of the times my axe head fell off, I was somewhere trying to fulfill the will of God. Somewhere trying to do what God told me to do. But I got confronted with what was of me and what was borrowed from somebody else. When we look from a spiritual standpoint, we realize the Jordan River represents death, doesn't it? You see that with the children of Israel leaving 12 stones inside the Jordan. That means the old nation has died, is buried in these waters, and on the other side they put 12 new stones. A new nation is going into that land of promise. Amen. Hallelujah. A new people. But there is that Joshua and Caleb that came from Egypt, came from that old thing all the way through and go in there with them. We find John the Baptist. He baptizes unto repentance there in that Jordan. What is happening is the repentant are leaving their sins in that watery grave to be washed away. And it is into Jordan's grave, Jordan's death, that that axe head had fallen. It is lost. That seems like a hopeless situation. How can it be retrieved? They're all standing there at the edge and plop, goes in the water. Pretty soon more of them come. They see it going down. They see it sinking. They don't have much money. That may as well be a car they drove down in there that they borrowed. They don't have money, and they're standing there thinking, what are we going to do? How are we going to get the money to replace all of this? And as that heart of the young prophet began to sink, He's watching it go as that axe head sinks. His heart sinks with it. And he's thinking, how am I going to get the money to pay that back? What was to be done about this situation? And you know the strangest thing? No one amongst this school of these chosen men knew. Nobody knew what to do about it. None of them has the mind of the Spirit. And they went to the previous generation... And sitting over here is that man, Elisha. And he comes from that previous generation. They don't know what to do. But there's a man amongst them that does. Praise God. Praise God for that. They went to that previous generation. And they're getting ready to talk to a man who has seen those waters parted by his master and walk across on dry ground. And he went across with him, but he received the same mantle, came back and struck him himself. At that point, there's nothing borrowed with him. He comes across, and they're now talking to the man that has split those waters. They don't know what he's going to do, and they certainly themselves don't know what they're going to do. All the men that were working were believing men. They're active men. You can't say they're useless. They're doing something. They were prophets. But the immediate thought of Elisha about all of this lost cause he, you know, they, they come to him, and he's the only one. Elisha's the only one that knows what to do. Everybody else, this is a lost cause. There's nothing that can be done. And sitting here today amongst us, there is an ax head that every one of us has. Things we've been taught, experiences that we've had, but every one of those things at some point is going to be challenged to make it become a part of what we are. It is God that leads us right there to the edge of our personal Jordan where we face Jordan's watery grave. And here we are advancing. Here we are cutting and felling those trees. I want to know more of God. I want to walk closer to Him. And I begin to find out that as I'm cutting and felling those trees and preparing the beams, my axe head flies off. And lands in that water. What is it to be done when that axe head falls? Sometimes our axe head is our health. I was taught all of my life that God heals the sick. My grandfather saw many miracles of divine healing. But I'm now 
older than him. I survived longer than him in this world. He died at 52, eight, 52 years of age of a massive heart attack. He's seen multitudes healed, but that never phased our faith in healing. We knew he was a man that lived for God with everything that he knew. And so all of my life I was taught that. My pastor believed it. I was taught that in church. I was raised, thank God, in Pentecostal churches. But sometimes we're challenged with our own health. And we discover it's easier to pray for someone else and believe for their healing than it is our own. Because we see and know our own flaws. We know our own faults. Not that we're in some awful sin. But we know the problems of character. We know the areas in our life where we need advancement. And the devil capitalizes on that. But yet, if we are praying for someone else and the devil accuses them, we say, how dare you? That's my brother. The blood of Jesus is against you. But we don't say that for ourselves. A lot of times we just take the abuse and keep praying for somebody else. But that miracle is for us. Our axe heads to swim too. Sometimes that axe head falls off. You go to the doctor's office. I think we've had many in the church. You know, they going through something. Dear sister had cancer, battled it for a long time, in a strange place in her body. And I remember she went to see the doctor, and that axe head fell off there. You know, she she'd been believing God. She had joy on her face. The test results didn't come back like she had hoped. And that axe head went off and went into that water. But she was trusted with everything in her. Amen. And it was a few days. It was a little bit rocky for her. But there come a day that axe head started floating back to the top of the water. She met me in the back of that church, still sick, cancer still there. And she said, brother, I live or die. I'm going to trust this God. And I can tell you that axe head come to the top of the water. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a miracle. God's moved in her life. That tumor is almost totally gone at this point. Amen. And she has joy in her life today. Hallelujah. Whatever that ax head is in our life, we're going to have to trust God to see that come through, to see it come up. The first thing that has to happen for that ax head to rise, of course, it has to fall in the water. Amen. Got to be challenged. It's easy to just study it and to quote it and know all those things. But there's a difference in a person who has faced the challenge and has seen that challenge be answered by God. That's why they went to Elisha. He's the master of that river. He's parted it. So they go to him. But the first thing that must be confronted is that carnal mind that says this is not possible. That's the first thing that came to the mind of these young prophets. We need that axe head to be confronted with, to be confronted by that carnal mind. We need those times of watching our efforts, all of our strength to fail and to go to Jordan's watery grave. All of my efforts at trying to produce righteousness and holiness. All my efforts at trying to be the man that I feel God wants me to be. Whacking on those trees and all of a sudden I went back and the axe head flipped into that water. What am I going to do now? There's been times in our life we thought, becoming what God wants me to be, I'm never going to get there. You know, years ago in my early 20s, I decided to help God out. I put hurdles in my life. You know, as if, as if it, you know, it, it, it ain't hard enough. <laughs> as if it isn't impossible enough already, I'm going to add hurdles to this, and I did. And I made it so impossible, I was miserable before God. And I had no hope of that axe head ever coming up. None of those men that stood amongst those young prophets had the mind of the Spirit for the situation. And they're the standouts. They're the chosen amongst the people. They're in that school of the prophets. And none of them, all of those first thought is, well, how are we going to get enough money? What are we going to do about this? It's hopeless. What excuse do we give? How, how can we get the money to be able to buy another axe head? For some, it's too small. Why even bother God about such a small thing? You think it's too small and you don't deal with God over that, you're going to miss out on a whole lot of things. Some of the greatest miracles begin in the little things. Amen. What a lesson I learned when I stood before those pyramids and saw how many stones they were made out of. 
A lot of little things in life is what produces the big things. Amen. Some of them looked at that and said, well, I know the laws of nature. You can't question that. That iron's more dense than water. It's going to go through, and it's going to keep going until it sinks down into that mud. Anybody got any scuba gear around here? Not on that day, of course, but the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That tells me there's a law of God, and that law counters, that law of God counters everything that is natural. The carnal mind is not capable, and it's not capable of subjecting itself to God. It's going to have to face an axe head falling in that water. That's why we face those impossible things. God brings us to our Jordan, to the edge of those waters, because we can't force this carnal mind to do it. And so he brings us to the place that demands a miracle from him. And the question is, are we going to trust him, or are we just going to run away, give up on him? And you find so many today that just say, well, that's just the way things are going to be. I look at a lot of the church world today, and they kind of just settle for things. Well, you know, that's the way it's going to be. Tell us what the doctor says. You know, we, we pray. Just let us know how it works out. If it don't, we have a good funeral for you. That may not be all the words that's said, but that hopelessness, that loss, that lostness is in that attitude and in that heart. The first thought, though, of the mind of the Spirit is different. You know, you listen to those young prophets. Alas! That's hopelessness. But you listen to the mind of the Spirit, it's the opposite. It is resurrection life. And how quickly the mind of the Spirit reacted to that. You, hear, you see Elisha, he's sitting over there wherever he was at, maybe under a tree or something. And they come over there and they've had this axe head fall in the water. He's sitting there and they come, alas, Master, it was borrowed, it's fallen in the water. Immediately, he doesn't say, well, let me go fast and pray about this. He said, where did it fall? Where fell it? Show me. And they're thinking, what, what's he going to do? He knows what he's going to do. He's a man of resurrection life. Even his dead bones raise somebody to life. Hallelujah. This is nothing for God. Amen. He says, where fell it? And the sons of the prophets, thank God they had somebody with them that had that mind of the Spirit. I don't know about you, but in my lifetime, I've had many times, I thought, what would Pastor Clendenin do if he was in this situation? I can't talk to him anymore. He's gone on to glory. You know, I, I've been overseas. My dad's not with me. And I think, what would Pastor Duke do in this situation? But over time, I've come to learn what he would do. Amen. But church, I've had to have that axe head fall in the water. It's had to become my own life and my own experience. Amen. T. Austin Sparks said a dear friend of his, an old preacher, just suddenly passed away. And he said his son came to me one day. And he said, I thought that just being with my dad and being in that church, helping him in ministry, that I stood on the same ground that man of God stood on. And he said, but when the moment he died and the responsibility landed in my lap, he said, my God, that accent has gone under the water. I can't make it float. Not his exact words, but that's what he was saying. And Mr. Sparks talked to him and dealt with him. And that man of God realized the situation and went to God with it. And all of a sudden, when he went to God, God began to make that axe head float. God doesn't bring us there to destroy us. He brings us there to make us. He brings us to that circumstance to bring us through by a miracle. <laughs> Hallelujah. I remember in 1996... My, my wife and I, she was pregnant with our daughter. I'm getting ready to go to the country of Armenia. <clears throat> I just come home from one trip, going to leave again. And I take her for a routine checkup at the doctor's office. This is early. Baby's not due for a while. And so we went to that doctor's office, and the woman doctor, she took me out of the room and took me aside. She said, I want to say this in front of your wife. She said, her blood pressure's through the roof. So there's a great danger. She could die. The baby could die. I said, I don't want to scare you and, and scare her in that room. So I'm telling you this. You need to make preparations. I've already called ahead to a special hospital, and we need you to get over there. And, and so, you know, I, 
I'm standing there. She's telling me all this. I went to my pastor. I went to that Elisha. I mean, I got something that's a little bigger than me at this point. My axe head went in that water. And I remember I went to that house and I knocked on the door. My mom opened that door and I'm standing in the doorway. They know me. I'm their son. They knew something was wrong. I went in there. My pastor, my dad's sitting in his chair. He's eating his dinner, tray. And I walked in with my wife. I'm standing there. And he looked at me and said, what's wrong? I told him what they said. He pushed that tray back, stood to his feet, and said, where fell it? His exact words were, he said, she shall live and not die. And that baby's going to live and not die. He didn't ask for what the numbers were. He didn't ask for what all the reports said. He didn't ask for all the things that's up and down and, and all that. He just said, where did it fall? Where did that ax head fall? In that moment, he come, he laid hands on my wife. That was an axe head moment, one of the many in mine and my wife's life. And that axe head, God made it float. I'm giving my daughter away next June. She's getting married. Amen. God brought my wife through that, through a miracle. Amen. And I've shared that almost every place I've ever been in this world. Hallelujah. Pastors, teachers, leaders, may God help us to bring that instant mind of the Spirit to our classroom. May God help us as parents to obediently bring the mind of the Spirit in that home. That when our children walk in that door, something devastating has happened. That we stand to our feet and say, where fell it? Even when there's something in our own home, that we can stand to our feet, even if our heart's broken, and say, where fell it? The axe head shall swim. God will make it live. God will make it right. It's not impossible. That axe head fell into the waters of death. It fell where 12 stones once were laid. I don't know if it's the exact spot, but it fell. It was where Elijah crossed onto dry ground, through dry ground, passed on the other side, and then ascended into glory. It's a place where John baptized Jesus, that same river. The axe head fell into Jordan's watery grave. And amongst the believing sons of the prophets, there was nobody that knew what to do. And all oh, we've seen that during COVID. I, I, I won't mention any names. I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But I was shocked at what I've seen in churches all over this world. You know, the first thing was I said, I'm not going to judge anybody and, and, you know, what they have to do. The restrictions, that every, because everybody was in different circumstances. But when it comes to the faith side of it, the impossible, the hopelessness of it, you know, the axe had fell in the water. And some was like, well, shut the church down and, and, and you know, and, and there's just nothing to be done anymore. I'm thinking, my God, that, you know, there, there's more to this than, than that. You know, and, and in fact, the people we lost, it was mainly over in agree with us opening again. And they never come back. And the people we gained came from churches that refused to open. So that's just how it all worked out. But it exposed worldwide. Where there was true faith and where there was not. Where there was a hopeless situation and where there was not. And now as the real truth is coming out behind all this stuff, it, it's a shocking thing. You find out how much we all knew it already, but how much we've been lied to. Amen. What a shame, though, with these prophets, school of the prophets, that not one of them had that mind of the Spirit, but stood there saying, Alas, what are we to do? Why was it that Elisha was the only one to have the mind of the Spirit? Why was that? Because he was the only one amongst them that had received the portion of the firstborn. If you go back to the beginning of his calling, and you find there that he desired a double portion, and that understood from the law is to receive the portion of the firstborn. We don't know about Elijah ever having a wife or any kids. I, he had a son, it was Elisha. And here, Elisha wants that portion of the firstborn, and he got it. Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken up into glory, then you shall receive that double portion. And as they passed over that Jordan to the other side, and that chariot caught up 
the prophet Elijah, it required that power of God and that flaming chariot to separate the two. Nothing else could. That's how closely he followed the man of God. And he stood there, Elisha stood and cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And in that event, as the mantle began to fall, there was a pre-Pentecost Pentecost that took place. And that mantle began to fall to the ground. And everything there spoke of that coming day of Pentecost that would be almost 800 years later when Jesus ascended and sent his mantle back down to the church. The mantle that fell from Elijah, Elisha took it up. He did not watch him ascend and then go running over there to the mantle maker's shop. Say, get out that material. No, no, that's too light. His mantle was darker. It, it, it's in this area right here. It's in that, get that one. That, that's the color. Now measure me. You know, his mantle hung from my shoulders a little below, below the knees. You know, I, I know that. I tried it on when he was sleeping one time. He doesn't know it. But can you measure? He didn't want a counterfeit. He didn't want some duplicate. He didn't want some kind of homemade thing. He wanted the very same mantle that parted those waters. He wanted the same power of God. And that's what we desire. Amen. When Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples got the same Holy Ghost. You hear, they don't do it as much now. But years ago, every one of these preachers on television, you know, I've got Catherine Coleman's anointing, whatever you think of her is whatever. I've got A.A. A. Allen's anointing, whatever you think of him, whatever. But everybody, I've got their mantle. And where are those people today? Amen? Because somewhere the axe head fell in the water and it never came up. But when you get what comes from God to your own personal life and it's challenged and it sinks into that water, I can tell you when God raises it, what a difference that will be. They went and the answer was from Elisha. The answer was to cut off that branch and cast it into the waters. That's the cross. You know, the worst, uh, the biggest problem they had with that axe head, it was borrowed. It came from somebody else and borrowed power, borrowed theology, borrowed experience. Anything borrowed in the spiritual life is going to sink to Jordan's watery grave. I've got a library full of books. I've collected them for years. i got too many of them, boxing them up. And I can tell you, it's not in those books. There's good things in there. But until they hit the muddy bottom of that river of the Jordan, they'll never be anything in my life. They have to hit the bottom, and they must come to the surface in resurrection power. Amen. I carried that school of Christ, those books and videos. I remember one morning, Brother Clendenin, I was going to the nation of Chile, Santiago de Chile. I'm going to open that school of Christ there. I'm going by myself. And I come outside in front of my door is boxes of books and videotape, VHS tape, way, way back. And I'm looking at all this, and I'm by myself. And here I am trucking through the airport in Miami, you know, carrying all that stuff. I got a cart, all this. I have all kinds. I got enough luggage for four or five people. And I'm going down there to open the School of Christ. You know, I'm carrying uh, something that's borrowed. You know, and I, so I get down there, and I was backward and shy, especially in those early years. And I stood in that airport. I don't know who I'm meeting. I got a name, but I don't know. I've never seen him. And I'm standing in that airport. And unfortunately, he's exactly like me. He's hiding out over there. I'm hiding out over here. I wish I had like my friend Stephen McKay had. He'd have jumped up on a chair and said, hey, who are you? Who's Brother David? And that guy would have come. But I wasn't like that. So I stood there, and the airport cleared. Pretty soon, about four people left. He come walking over. Are you Brother David? Yes, I am. And I'd seen him standing there for probably an hour. We went and started that school. But I had, I had a borrowed axe head. I carried a borrowed axe head to a lot of places. Amen. I, I know, church, I'm, I'm not Brother Clendenin. I don't aspire to be. God didn't call me to be that. But I'm telling you, everything he ever taught me, it was borrowed until God let it fall into that Jordan and resurrected by his power. Amen. And, and so I remember years later, I've shared this here before, but he called me and he said, 
I can't go to Peru. First week of the school, I want you to go. You teach that, son. You know how it was. You teach that, son. You just take them books and you go ahead and teach it. Think, me? Teach the school? Who am I? I'm 25 years old. You have all this experience, and they're expecting you. They're going to put up with me for a week. I'm just glad he didn't tell me to close it. That would have been worse. Him leave, and now me get up there and trembling. And, but he had me go over there, and thank God, he, he showed up. He was able to cancel his meeting. He showed up there. I had my books. I'm scared to death. I'm going to try to you know, get my borrowed axe head out and teach that class. But he said, son, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay. I want you to help me film this school. We filmed it, put it in that Spanish language. And uh, I was thankful, you know. But a few years later, he calls me and he tells me again, Peru. He said, you go, you open that school. We got 452 students teaching in the gymnasium of the Assembly of God headquarters. Okay. Well, I went that first seven days. I taught that school. And I can tell you, the axe head had already hit the bottom, but it began to come up a little bit. Pastor Clendenin showed up. I introduced him. He said, son, he said, you need to tell this class what we're doing. You taught them for a week. You, you make this exchange here. So I did. I told him, I said, I've shared with you. I poured my heart out for a week. I said, but my teacher's here. The man I learned from, I'm going to yield this to him now and let him have this. And I stepped aside, glad to do it. Amen. And he stepped up there. A year or two, some years after that, he sent me to Egypt. He was having emergency surgery. He couldn't go. He told me to teach that school again. That axe head hadn't got to the top of the water yet. But I know why it had it. He gave, he told me, he said, you go, you teach that school. and You take Brother Brian, a young man in our church with you. If you want, I'll buy his ticket. We bought it that day. You know, I'm not going to go down there and watch that axe head sink by myself, have somebody with me. <laughs> but I walked into that school and God came down. The axe head began to rise. I'm not him. I don't teach it exactly like him. He wouldn't want me to. He talked to me one time. He told me, he said, son, that school's in you. He said, you got to let it come out. You can't just stay stuck on those notes. And he didn't tell that somebody else. He told them some other thing, personal to them. But he told me personally, he said, you've got to let that flow, you know. And he just gave me advice talking to me. And I was so grateful for that. That's lasted me a long time. But I watched that day as that axe head began to float. But in our story, the only way to get that axe head up was they had to cut that new branch off of that tree. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us that's a new handle, but I look at it as a new handle. I've stood there many times with this old handle. That axe head didn't fit very good. It falls off. But you get that new handle that's cut off because of the cross. And I can tell you, you cast in that new, that new axe handle, and that axe will always rise up to meet it. And when God can turn you into the person he desires you to be, he can make the faith that mama had be your faith and it not be a borrowed thing. He can make the faith that grandpa had, that saw the miracles, the resurrections, that saw God's power, he can make that the power of God in your life, and it won't be a borrowed axe head. Amen. That day, that axe head went to the bottom, and when it went to the bottom, they're all standing there looking. Church, God led those men there that day, especially the one that lost it, because I can tell you when that axe head come up, he said, take it to you, and he grabbed it, and he's looking at that thing. That wasn't the same axe head anymore. I mean, I know in substance it's the same. But this one now, I mean, in the morning, that was borrowed. Now it's come up by resurrection life. It's got a testimony attached to it. Hey, man, they probably went and framed that somewhere. But I can tell you, that axe head in the morning, you could pick one of those up at any hardware store in Jerusalem or Bethel. You know, you just pick one up if you had the money to buy it. But that one that come out of the water has got resurrection life attached to it. Scratched up, got a few marks on it, been used, sharpened several times. It doesn't matter. That thing works, and the power of God's brought it to the surface. And when God can make a new person out of us, he will always bring that power to our life. That axe head will swim in your life and mine. Amen. If I just yield myself to him and allow him to do what he desires to do. Amen. I've not accomplished great things in my life, but I've striven to just do what he's told me to do. 
to go down to the edge of the Jordan if that's where he wants me to be. I don't go to every mission that I'm invited on. I go where God tells me to go. I want to be faithful to him. I want to just do what God tells me to do. This morning, you may be standing at the Jordan. And you may be standing at that place and you feel like that axe head's gone into the water. Maybe you've been waiting for a miracle in your life a long time. And you've come to a place you'd never admit it publicly, but in your heart sometimes you think, I'm never going to get it. And you're standing there like that young prophet saying, alas, it's fallen into the water and it was borrowed. Others got their miracle, but I tried to borrow their faith and it didn't work for me. Church, individual person, God brought you to the edge of that river, not to lose the ax head, but to make it yours, to make it your experience. And if you're at the edge of those waters today, you're right where God wants you to be. You're right where he can do the miracle in your life today. Would you stand with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we're here in this place with the dear family of God. I stand here amongst the people, God, that are working, that have taken the axe and have gone to fail the trees. God, this church and the people in it desire enlargement, enlargement in their personal walk, enlargement in ministry, enlargement in the church, enlargement in the church's ministries. And Lord God, it's in that working and in that desiring that we always come to the challenges where the ax head can fall off into that water. Lord, you don't bring us there to lose it, but you bring us there, Lord, to give us resurrection life. You bring us to that point, Lord God, that you might reveal who you are to us as individuals. And I pray, pray in this house this morning for each and every one. Lord God, that as we come into these altars, Lord God, that you would make our axe head to swim. God, as we come, that our faith, Lord, that may have been borrowed, but today it can become our own. That our experiences may have been borrowed, but Lord God, you can make them in reality our own experiences today. God, you can cut us off of Christ and that new person that has been cut off of that old and grafted into Christ is new. You can bring that axe head up to that new life every time. Lord God, I pray that you would meet us here in these altars. In the name of Jesus, God, make that axe head to swim. Let it meet. Lord God, that old handle that's been cut off from that old tree, grafted into Christ, let it, let that axe head arise and to meet him. Church, can we meet him in this altar this morning? Can we come into this place and say, God, what you have taught me, what is an axe head that came from someone else and is borrowed, it's good, it's truth, but Lord God, I want it to be my truth. I want it to be my resurrection life. Lord God, I want it to be my miracle. God, I want the healing to be my healing, Lord God. Not just seeking somebody else's miracle, but Lord God, you have one for me. You brought me to the waters. You brought me to the place to see that ax head hit those Jordan waters and begin to sink. And it's you, Lord, that will bring it to a rise to meet that new person in Christ that's come through the cross. We thank you, Lord, today. Every step I take is a step of faith. I can't see what's in front of me. I walk on and just believe. He hears my prayers. And when I get there,
It ain't over till God says it's over. What a place to be in. At a point at the Jordan of an impossibility. That's not a bad place to be in because it's oftentimes the Lord will pull you to that place. It's really like a crossroad in your life. Which direction will you go? Will you trust God? Will you believe in the God of Elijah? Or will you go a different direction? I've been there. I've been there many times, Brother Darren. What a powerful word. So many things. The Lord has spoken to so many hearts in so many different ways today. What a word from heaven. I remember when Pastor Taylor died. Those of you who knew Brother Red Taylor, you know he's a mighty man of God. And I said, Lord, I need you now. I don't know if I can do what he did. I couldn't do what he did. I needed my own experience. I needed that axe head to swim. And soon after he passed away, 
we begin to see miracle after miracle. The Lord was saying to me as I was with him, if you'll trust me and believe, I'll be with you. Amen. So many experiences we all have at that Jordan. We need God. As an act of obedience, we do our part. But if he doesn't work the miracle, it's not going to get done. We must believe. There has to be an act of our will, our obedience, our trust. And then he does what only he can do. Wait upon the Lord. He's still a God of miracles. Can we stand? What a powerful word for this congregation. This is what we needed this morning, Brother Darren. It's what this church needed today. Brother Darren's going to be preaching to us tonight. Come, expect God to speak to us again, move in these altars. Father, we thank you for what you have done, what you have said to us. Lord, I believe that something has taken place in these altars this morning through this word that's going to be life-changing. Lord, something happened in the realm of the Spirit. I believe, Lord, as the Word of God gave came forth today. I pray, Lord, that you would produce life and that life more abundantly. Let faith arise out of all of our doubt and fears. Lord, we can do nothing without you. We can do nothing without you. All of the games of religion are worthless. We can do nothing without Holy Ghost life, without the cross, without resurrection power. Lord, I pray that you would help us in these final hours of the dispensation of grace. In these final days, you've called us to work a work, to do your will. Empower us, God. Lord, when we stand at the crossroads, when it looks hopeless and helpless, to call upon the God of our fathers and believe that you are able to do as you did for them, you can do for us. Help us to have our own experience. Oh God, I'm asking you to help us. Let this word that's been preached in the hearing of our ears today, let it lodge deep within our hearts. Let it change us and transform us by the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, we love you for it. And give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Praise the Lord. Come expecting tonight, 6 p.m. God's going to help us in this service. Open my God's head.